The concertmaster solo from Brahms' first symphony is probably my favorite solo in any symphony. It is divinely beautiful. Um, it is an absolute joy to play. Um, it has a, an incredible chamber music quality to it. Um, and it's just, uh, it really can't get music that's better than this. So um, some of the things to think about when approaching this excerpt, um, I mentioned one of them already playing like a chamber musician. Of course, this is a solo not just for the concertmaster, but it's actually a duo with the principal French horn. Um, and that's a really important thing to keep in mind when playing this, um, because the texture of the whole um, music, this whole excerpt, is different from many other concertmaster solos out there. Um, you're, you're really uh, kind of playing as a chamber musician, there's never any period of time where you're playing completely alone. Um, it's not flashy and virtuosic like, um, say, a Scheherazade excerpt. So it really uh, has to do with nuance and character and um, beautiful sound. Um, of course, the other thing to talk about is, is the approach to sound. And I actually think thinking about the relationship of the uh, solo with the um, French horn solo is a really important one in determining what kind of sound to go for. So let's start from the beginning here. Um, when we start off the solo at uh, rehearsal letter E, um, it's a beautiful moment where the violin and horn kind of rise out of the orchestral texture. Um, uh, the tutti's kind of playing um, some triplet figures um, and kind of a, a very gentle, um, kind of warm uh, sound is coming from the orchestra and the horn and the violin just emerge out of that. So we have to find a sound that is appropriate for this um, for this line here. Now, the horn has such a special sound. Of course, it really comes from a place of purity. So, so while the horn and the violin start off playing um, the same melodic line together, the horn kind of represents this openness and um, this really foundational, pure sound. And the violin is kind of um, the, the uh, icing on top of the cake, if you will. The, the solo violin just adds a shimmer and a sparkle um, with the vibrato that rises on top of the horn line. Um, and it's, uh, you know, for those of you who know or have played uh, Brahms's horn trio for violin, horn, and piano, you know how special a uh, quality this instrumentation has. So um, I like to keep as much of this first line on the E string. I think it's just a, a, a beautiful scintillating sound um, that, that you can just kind of float on top of what the horn is playing. So... As much of a continuous vibrato as possible, and I'm really trying to keep the bow moving um, I don't want to get stuck in, uh, with the bow at all. Now, dynamically, um, we have espressivo to start. Um, we have a crescendo coming up to forte in a few measures. So um, you want to come out of the texture. You don't want to be small. You want to be... Um, have enough core to the sound, but you want to also give enough space so that you can grow more later. So I'm really trying to actually float the bow and I'm rather close to the bridge so that I can float the bow, um, but still produce um, you know, the, the amount of sound that I want. And here 
I really try to think of um, uh, kind of pulling in even closer to the bridge and really going for full hair. This is where you can um, uh, kind of dig into that incredibly soloistic sound um, that you're just uh, singing on top of the whole orchestra here. to stay um, in that full hair, full bow hair, kind of close to the bridge, contact point. Um, it's a very satisfying way of playing this line throughout that whole forte section of the last two bars of, um, of that opening phrase. And to, uh, you wanna make sure that that last, um, uh, part of the bar gets a little bit of extra love from the left hand, especially that E, to kind of show that um, side figure. It's, a, it's written as a um, hairpin down or a decrescendo, but we know in Brahms that is a, a meaning of um, espressivo. So give it something uh, extra in the left hand there. Um, and this next uh, gesture, same thing, you really want to sigh, and it really comes from a beautiful uh, vibrato. Um, I use third finger for this E, and then kind of a, an extension back to fourth position. Um, if you have a, a really lovely, strong fourth finger, feel free to use that, but I just think uh, third finger vibrato, especially in Brahms, uh, especially in lyrical Brahms, is uh, incredibly satisfying and appropriate. So going on um, to the next bit here, let's keep in mind that the horn continues with um, the you know, original melody here. And uh, the solo violin kind of takes over as an ornamentation or a variation on that tune. So um, we want to sound accompanimental, but um, the actual sound that we're producing still has to cut through what is happening in the rest of the orchestra. So uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to go for a nice full bow hair approach, and I'm uh, staying relatively close to the bridge. <laughs> giving um, enough uh, vibrato to start that line on that E. So that um, uh, the, the listener is drawn to that line in addition to uh, what is going on in the horn part and the rest of the orchestra. Now rhythmically it's um, very important to remember here that there are triplets going on underneath uh, in, in, the, in the orchestral texture. So it's easy to want to kind of over uh, phrase and, and do extra rubato here, especially if you're playing this in an audition setting where you're alone on stage. Um, but that's not uh, how it would be played in context. You know, in context, you're gonna actually have a fairly rigid uh, rhythmic structure to adhere to. So you want to keep that um, kind of general pulse in mind and stick to uh, a true 16th note, ryth note rhythm. So if you notice, I'm essentially playing uh, straight 16th notes, but I'm using um, kind of the shape of the phrase to make it interesting. I'm really, really exaggerating my shaping. So going up these four, uh, first four notes and bringing out those next four and so on. So bringing out the groupings of notes um, and using your, your bowing to, um, to bring that out as, as a speaker would with her or his voice. The same thing applies in the next two measures of that phrase. And again here, 
if you um, you know stick a metronome on uh, and and play this passage with a metronome, it is surprising how um, remarkably fast these sextuplets actually go. Um, so really kind of let them and then you can try to expand a little bit towards the top because I think that's a really natural way of phrasing um, and the whole orchestra would be doing that anyway. But you want to be careful of, um, again, kind of spreading out these sextuplets too much. Often you'll hear... And um, in the context of the orchestra, that's just too slow and lugubrious. So we really want to still, you know, maintain a sense of rhythmic pulse. And within that, continue your beautiful shaping and phrasing. Um, this last note here, the uh, G sharp, I allow myself to take two bows here. It kind of depends on um, perhaps how you're feeling in the moment. You want to have an in the string sound, something that's, again, brilliant and, uh, and shimmering. Um, but you don't want it to be choked in any way. So if you need to take an extra bow, please do, uh, please go ahead and do that. Going on from here, oh, I love this. Uh, basically, well, the whole excerpt is amazing, but these next few lines are just so loving. Now, we have a diminuendo written over three measures here, but as is the case with really any concertmaster solo you may be preparing, you want to remember that um, dynamic changes, especially to the pianissimo and piano level, are really um, soloistic dynamic markings. So um, I'm making a diminuendo here but um, I'm still aware of uh, if my sound is projecting over the rest of the orchestra or not. So I'm really kind of uh, taking an approach where I, I, I try to have good bow contact. I never want to kind of drift um, into fingerboard, so tasto land over here, because um, it simply won't project over the rest of the orchestra. Now, of course, there are other cases in um, various solos, we can think of uh, Scheherazade, we can think of Heldenleben, where there are plenty of moments where no one else is playing in the orchestra. So you can definitely push the envelope in terms of your low dynamics in some of those excerpts. But here, um, you're, you're playing along with the rest of the orchestra. So you just have to keep kind of your, um, your dynamic levels in mind and, and make sure that your sound is always projecting, even at the lower level. So I'm ending my contact point still kind of in the middle of um, of the string here, not very close to the fingerboard, and I'm going for a nice warm sound to end. And, and that's all I, you know, that's the extent of the diminuendo for me. Um, you don't wanna go below that. Now going on from here, uh, remember again, this excerpt is all about chamber music and the solo line now joins the rest of the violins in this next line. So kind of have that, that feeling. I think psychologically it's really helpful for me to, to imagine you know, joining the sound. And so you don't have to press, um, you're just floating above um, the, the section sound here.
um, you'll notice that I go over to the A string in the last one and a half bars or so of that line on that B. It kind of reminds me of um, maybe how a mezzo-soprano would sound, something with a little bit more depth um, and uh, contrast to the E string sound that you started with. Now the last few bars um, <clears throat> are really important to, um, you know, we've been thinking a lot about the horn and, and the rhythms that are being played throughout the rest of the orchestra. Now here your attention and your imagination should be on the timpani. Um, again, just a, 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 another reminder to always know what's happening in the score for any excerpt that you're preparing. But here um, in the last about five bars of this movement, the timpani has um, uh, kind of establishes the, the tempo, this kind of slowing down of, of the whole movement with repeated triplets. So um, it starts in five measures before, before the end. Um, so you really wanna be imagining that and, and imagining, you know, if you're sitting in an orchestra, you're sitting in the concertmaster seat and the timpani is all the way in the back of the orchestra, what kind of communication you need to have to compensate for that physical space between the two of you. So I'm really imagining um, kind of connecting to someone that's, uh, you know, far away from me for these triplets and, and really trying to play chamber music with them. So. Um, I, I think, again, it's a psychological kind of approach, but if you can imagine that you're not playing this alone, even if you are playing this alone in an audition, it just makes more sense to you and the listener. Of course, your committee is going to know the music like the back of their hand. So um, uh, just playing this like a, a very sensitive chamber music musician will really go a long way here. Um, in terms of uh, kind of bow distribution, I like to start in the upper half of the bow here with a little bit more kind of core to begin. And then I lighten up to the top. And again, I play this last note with a third finger um, so I can have a really juicy, um, supple vibrato. Now this last note, the last G sharp, uh, I take three bows here. I land on a down bow and then I take an up and then one more down. And, you know, it, it's easy to kind of reach that G sharp in three measures before the end and, and kind of, um, you know, say I'm finished and, and kind of zone out until you've um, finished your, your note. But it's really important to remember that there's still music going on in the rest of the orchestra. And you can still bring this out if you're just playing this in an audition. So, um, two measures before the end, the orchestra uh, is playing a sustained chord. And then typically there's a slight breath before the final chord in the last bar. And it's important that the violin solo continues to sing throughout that breath, right? Um, so even if you're playing by yourself, you want to imagine that the sound continues. And maybe that you take your final down bow after the orchestra is already playing that final chord. So you really want to imagine that your sound is alive and warm and singing all the way really to the end um, of your final down bow. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, 
it's a you know a level of detail that not everyone is going to bring to the table in an audition but if you're if you're paying that much attention to um, kind of the texture of the orchestra and, and reacting to that in your own solo playing that's going to come across really beautifully to an orchestral audition committee well I hope that this was helpful for you um, I hope that you enjoy working on this beautiful excerpt and I look forward to seeing you for the next edition of An Excerpt a Day.